Good evening, everyone. My name is Doug Rickard. I'm the principal at Bournda Environmental Education Centre. We're part of the Sapphire Coast Regional Science Hub Sustainability Education Network. And you are here because we have a special guest tonight, Dr. David Nichols, astronomer, who will be presenting the August night sky. I was going to put in the title, David, that it was the August night sky with the August David, August David Nichols. And, uh, and we're, we're delighted to have you here. And uh, I did want to start proceedings by acknowledging the traditional custodians, the um, Dhirigaj people of the Yuan Nation on whose lands I'm sitting uh, for this meeting in Bournda National Park at the center. And uh, I think whenever you turn your thoughts to astronomy in this country, you think of the, the rich stories and songs and dances that must have developed uh, around thousands of years of observing the night sky. And most of us are familiar with stories about the emu in the sky, which is one of those uh, traditional stories about night sky features, but there, there would be uh, many, many thousands of stories available there. And uh, we're, we're here as part of National Science Week, um, supported by Inspiring Australia, New South Wales. Jackie Randall's the manager of Inspiring Australia, New South Wales, is responsible for promoting and encouraging science activities all through the state through science hubs like our science hub. And we're very grateful for the support provided. We've had a wonderful week. Uh, unfortunately, so many things had to be um, cut back or uh, cancelled due to the, the lockdown, obviously, but we had gone with a 50-50 plan for online content, and that's really <laughs> was wise to do. We've had 10, I think this is the 10th webinar that uh, we've had uh, since Science Week started, so it's been a busy program, and we've got one more. In terms of housekeeping, I can just encourage everyone um, to have Q&A, uh, there's a Q&A button on your controls there where you can direct some questions, which I'll um, keep an eye on for David. Um, we, we haven't got a huge crowd. I think, you know, um, it was um, very good of David um, to take this on at short notice. And um, But we've got a high quality audience of people that have registered. And at some point, um, I can give people the microphone and we'll let you speak um, directly um, to David and ask your questions directly to David and that will make it a little bit more interactive. But please use the chat if there's anything you want to raise or, or point out in connection with the um, presentation. But we'll probably work through the whole presentation, David, and, and then have the Q&A rather than stopping at different points. If you feel that you, you want to stop at any point, you know, just please indicate that and we can do that. Um, the other thing that will happen at the end of the presentation is that when it's all done and dusted, there's an evaluation uh, which goes to Inspiring uh, Australia, New South Wales, and we would encourage you to fill that in with your comments. Um, that sort of, um, I'm sure it'll be positive, positive feedback. David did a session for us last year and it was very well received. And uh, that sort of data is useful for us, obviously, in, in uh, demonstrating that we're, we're doing the science communication work that the Science Hub is supposed to be doing. So um, without any further ado, David, I will hand over to you and allow you to um, share your screen and we will get the, uh, the ball rolling. Okay, I'm on, am I? Yes, we can hear you fine. Jolly good. Okay, well, as Doug said, I'm David Nichols. I work up at Mount Stromlo Observatory, except that it's all by board broadband these days. And I shall, rather than make you suffer looking at me, I shall share my screen, which will take share screen. Well, uh, off I'll go. Um, right. Now, all I need to do is to find a way of... So what's this talk about? Um, well, it was going to be what you can see in the evening sky, except that it's cloudy here. So that's normal for me. Um, but when it does get clear again, which will probably be tomorrow, the things to be that are easiest to see, and perhaps the, the nicest, are the planets Jupiter, Venus, and Saturn, and the moon. 
I'm going to talk about um, telescopes and binoculars um, and what to avoid, the wobbly tripod. And I also want to talk about briefly about the applications you can put on your tablet or smartphone that will help you learn what the, what the sky is about, what, what, how to find things. Right. So what's in the night sky? There are many things to look at, but if you go outside after this talk, or if it's cloudy tomorrow, etc., an hour after sunset, look into look up into the western sky and you'll see a brilliant yellowish white star. And that's not a star, actually, it's the planet Venus. It's our nearest twin, and it's nearly the same size as the Earth, but it is extremely different from Earth. It's not a nice place at all. In fact, it's so different unless we really make a mess of our climate, um, we won't, hopefully we won't emulate Venus because it's a perfect example of a runaway greenhouse effect. The surface temperature of Venus is around 470 Celsius, pressure is about 90 atmospheres, which is something like 900 meters below the surface of the water, I believe. And the weather forecast for Venus is cloudy with occasional sulfuric acid showers. Not a good place. Most of the probes that the Russians have landed on Venus have died in a, within a few minutes of landing. We can't actually see it when we look at it through telescopes. We can't see the surface of the planet because of the thick carbon dioxide cloud layers. NASA launched the Magellan Space Probe back in 1990 and mapped its surface using radar. So we've got a pretty good idea of the surface of Venus uh, and it mainly shows volcanoes and lava flows. So it's um, pretty horrible but it's very pretty in the night sky. Now, if you look at Venus through a small telescope, and I'm talking about something with an aperture between 60 millimeters and maybe in, in upwards, you'll see as the months, as the weeks go on, the, the shape of Venus changes. It moves in the sky. It moves, it, Venus is um, closer to the sun than us so that it catches up with us as it comes around. Uh, and as it does so, we see different views of it. At the moment, the one we can see is pretty like the, the image on the right-hand side there. Um, but as it moves past us, it gets closer and slowly but surely gets more and more crisp. But as it does so, it also gets back towards the sun because um, it's moving in, indeed in front of the sun um, fr fr from our perspective. But if you, if you follow it day by day or week by week, you'll see it show these phases. A funny little aside, in the last, in the 19th century, every now and then people would look at the, at the very um, narrow crescent Venus, and sometimes they would see what appeared to be a glowing dark side. In those days, they of course didn't know much about Venus or what the temperatures were. Uh, and they thought that the glow might be due to fireworks displays due to the Venusians having a new government. Um, however, since this happened quite regularly, people concluded that the stability of the government of Venus was somewhat doubtful. That said, um, there's a lot of debate as to whether this glowing is real or not. It was certainly observed by plenty of people uh, back in the 19th century, but there are, there are there are those now who think it's think it was wrong. That you, under these circumstances, the older observers are probably right. It's known as the ashen light, but there's quite a lot of controversy as to whether it occurs. And it doesn't occur that often, at least not when we can see it easily enough. But anyway, Venus is a beautiful sight in the evening sky, but it's best seen with your naked eye. Because if you look at it with a telescope, you just see this bland white disk merely because we can only see the top of the clouds. So anyway, Venus is, is pretty for, to the, for visually, but not much chop if you've got a telescope or binoculars. So anyway, what else is there to see in the night sky? If you wait an hour or so after sunset, preferably not tonight because it's cloudy, uh, an hour or so after sunset, look in the eastern sky. There's, there's, there's another bright, yellow white star, not quite as bright as Venus, but still pretty bright. And that's the planet Jupiter. It's the largest planet in the solar system with a diameter about 11 times that of the Earth. Above and to the left of Jupiter is a dimmer yellowish star, and that's the planet Saturn. 
But if when you get a clear sky, look about an hour or so after sunset when it's when the sky is properly dark, you can see both of them quite easily with the naked eye. Getting back to Jupiter, it's a very interesting sight in a small telescope. Now you won't see anything quite as spectacular as you do from the NASA space probes, particularly the Juno probe. If you just type in NASA and Jupiter, you'll see some absolutely gorgeous pictures taken close up. But what you can see is a small disk of, of Jupiter through a small telescope, and most likely most of the four large moons, Ganymede, Callisto, Europa, and Io. These are about the same size plant, uh, moons as our own moon, two are bigger, two are smaller, but that gives you some idea that they are a long way away because all you really see them is, 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 is stars, unless you've got a very big telescope, in which case you can see them as disks. This is a sort of impression of what you will see. This is slightly better than you would normally see, but um, this is typical. They all move around Jupiter, uh, so they're not always going to be in this pattern. They'll, sometimes they'll be two right close together. Sometimes one will be behind Jupiter. Sometimes it'll be in the shadow. So you don't always see four. Io is the most is the closest to Jupiter, and it moves around the fastest. The other ones, the further out they are, the slower they are to move. What you'll see through a small telescope looks more like this. And this is quite typical of what you'd, what you'd see with a small telescope. By that, I mean uh, something of the order of 60 millimeters up to maybe 200 millimeters in diameter, lens or mirror. You will also, if you, if, you, if you can focus it nicely, you can also see the bands. That's going back, you can see the cloud bands then. So you can see them through a small telescope. And they, they are the, the, the surface features on Jupiter. Jupiter doesn't have a, a, a hard surface. If you jumped on, if it jumped out of a putative spaceship and into the clouds of Jupiter, you just keep falling until you, until you started to float, which is the point at which your, the density of the gas you were in was the same as the density of you. If you dropped a cannonball, it would go a bit deeper, but eventually things float. There's no, there's no hard surface. And because it's entirely a gas planet, when, what are known as a, ga it's a gas giant. Unlike the rocky planets, Mercury, Venus, Mar uh, Earth, and Mars, uh, the outer planets, the major outer planets, are all gas giants. They would, the moons were discovered by Galileo in 1610, and this was a landmark in the development of Western science because it gave the lie to the assumption that everything went around the Earth. Unfortunately for Galileo, the church, the, the church in Rome at least, had decided that they favored the Earth being the center of everything. So everything went around the Earth. But when Galileo saw things which were actually going around Jupiter, he realized that the, here was a, uh, a, a problem for the geocentric view of life. And it tied in much better with uh, Copernicus's view, which had been publicized some several decades earlier. But the, what happened to Galileo was that he questioned the church's authority, not on matters of faith or morals, but about astronomy. But since they didn't like their, their, their authority being questioned, he got into a lot of, lot of problems. It was, however, one of the great discoveries of modern science, and Galileo is one of perhaps the three greatest scientists, in my opinion, who've ever lived. The other two would be Newton and Einstein. Some of you may, may say, what about Hawking? Hawking is a very good scientist, an extremely fine scientist, but he's not, I wouldn't class him with those three. And of those three, I'd say Newton was the greatest, followed by Einstein and Galileo. It's rather hard to, it's a personal choice. Anyway, Galileo discovered the moons, and he also looked at Saturn. Now, this is a rather better view than you'll get of Saturn in a small telescope. It has a number of moons, and the one, if you can see it, below and to the left of the screen is the moon Titan, which is the only moon in the atmosphere, in the, in the, um, in the solar system that has an atmosphere. And in fact, the um, Cassini mission dropped a probe, the Huygens probe, onto the surface of Titan, and they discovered there were lakes and rivers, uh, as well as rocky landscapes. The only interesting thing is that the lakes were made out of liquid methane, as were the rivers, and the rocks were hard rock ice. 
So while it looks a lot like Earth, it's extremely cold and the liquids are quite different. But anyway, you'll see if you look at Saturn through a small telescope, you can see the rings. And for the, if you see them for the first time, they really are quite beautiful. The rings themselves are quite thin, extremely thin, uh, and they are kept in place by what are called shepherd moons. Now, there's a couple of little tiny ones which live in the, in the rings themselves, and they seem to keep them stable. It's not clear whether the rings are a permanent feature. In fact, they probably aren't. Uh, but at the moment, we can see them. They, they, they reflect the light very well, and, and they're easy to see. But you won't see them through binoculars. You'll certainly see them through, uh, through a small telescope. Now, I still remember when I first saw it back in about 19, when was it? Oh, 19 something, 60, 59. I saw them when I was about nine years old, or no, a bit older than that, 14. Beautiful sight. The moon, however, is much the easiest thing to look at. And it's amazing if you haven't looked at it in detail through a telescope, it's definitely worth looking at. And it's extremely easy to see through even, the small, even a small telescope. One thing you need to know though, is everybody thinks, oh, I want to see the full moon, I'll see all the craters. As you can see on the, pic the picture on the right, it's very boring when you look at it because everything is flattened. You can't see the, the topography. All you can see is gray shapes. You can see some craters here and there and you can see the maria, the seas as they call them, which are actually lava plains. But when the, when the at half moon or crescent moon or a gibbous moon, such as at present, you'll see the craters side lit and you get a much better feel for the terrain of the moon. And as you can see, the picture on the left there shows all the, how many enormous, the enormous number of craters that there are, are actually on the, that's the side we can see. The moon, because of the way its orbit works, is always points the same face towards us. It's, it's locked, it's, or it's, it's, in, its rotation is locked to its orbital timing. It does wobble a bit, so you can see slightly more than 50% of the moon. Sometimes it's tilting left, sometimes it's tilting right, but you never actually see the, the, the back of the moon. You have to get into a, you have to fly around the back of it in order to see those. But most of the craters, certainly the vast majority of the craters, seem to be on our side. Um, but if you compare the two pictures there, you can see practically none in that big wodge uh, left of upper center, whereas when it's side lit, uh, you can see literally thousands of them. And it's, an, it's a marvelous sight. And if you, on a good night, you can zoom in with a, with a telescope and see the details of the crater. Some that you can probably see there have central peaks and you can see the sun rising over the peaks and the shadows of the peaks. It really is a beautiful thing to look at. But the half moon is always more interesting than a full moon. When the moon, the full moon, which is where we're heading towards at the moment, has gone past full moon and we get a dark sky, the thing to look up to look out for is the Milky Way. At the moment, if you go out, let's say maybe 10 days time when the moon is, uh, is before the moon rises, go out about 7.30 p.m. and look straight up and you'll see the Milky Way it goes right across the sky at the moment. And what we're looking at is the center of our galaxy. Uh, the galaxy, if you can think of putting two dinner plates together with their faces towards each other, you get a fat bit in the middle and then thin bits at the edge. Uh, um, our, um, our galaxy, and it's a very big galaxy, the Milky Way, uh, is a disk with a fat center. And when we look straight up uh, at the moment, you can see the middle of our galaxy. It's just, you can see it as a bulge. You'll also see dark dust clouds. In that particular case, that's not the bit I'm talking about. That's the, the Southern Cross is, no, it's not, where is it? Yeah, Southern Cross is in that picture. You can't tell because there's so many stars. That of course is a long exposure photograph. So it's not quite that good, but nonetheless, you do see these dark lanes. And the one sort of like a slightly bent boomerang is in fact the emu, which Doug mentioned. Above that uh, is the great wide bulge of the central Milky Way. They're generally older stars, the ones, the newest, younger stars tend to form in the outer parts of the Milky Way, where we are. We're about two thirds of the way to the edge. Now, David, look, I, I did say earlier, uh, Lawrence has got his hand up and I assume he wants to ask something about this slide. Um, sure. Lawrence, uh, if you could 
unmute. Um, um. I didn't have a question. I don't know what I pressed, Doug. <laughs> <laughs> Look, I just knowing you, Lawrence, I just thought Lawrence has got some amazing observation from, you know, being in a kayak somewhere down near in Antarctica that he wants to tell us about. But yeah, then again, um, yeah, but that's all right. But I, I can let people talk if they want. But um, yeah, thank you. <laughs> Meanwhile, back at the Milky Way. The um, you can see two little puffs of light to the left of that picture. They look like little bits of broken off Milky Way. In fact, they are separate galaxies. They're dwarf galaxies. They're not, as, not even remotely as big as the Milky Way. They are very likely in orbit around our Milky Way, uh, and they may eventually get gobbled up by the Milky Way through, by being dragged into its gravitational field. They're about, one's about 160,000 light years away. The other one's about 200 and something thousand light years away. So they're, they're, the light is quite old. Um, the light left the nearer of the two round about the time mankind was evolving from apes. So it gives you something to think about. And Neanderthal man was probably making stone tools and wandering around Ice Age Europe. But they are nonetheless separate clouds. They're known as the Mag Magellanic clouds and they were first seen by Ferdinand Magellan when he went around the world. Actually, he didn't get all the way around the world. He died on the way back. But um, the Magellanic clouds are, are small galaxies and they're like little sort of miniatures going around our own big galaxy. But you can see them, you can't see them at the moment unless you're up at about two in the morning. If you are up at two in the morning and it's a dark night and there's no full moon and it's not cloudy, if, 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 then you'll see these two little patches of light. Now, one thing I would say about our region of, the, uh, of, of New South Wales is that we don't have any big cities close by and if you're not right next to a, a set of streetlights or not down in the middle of Marimbula or Bega or anywhere, the sky is remarkably dark and you can see these things standing out beautifully against the, like, like little luminous powder puffs against the, the velvet and the stars, stars thereon. Of various places I've seen at night sky, I've seen the night sky from, there are three places, that stand, three places that stand out in my, my mind as being the best places I've ever seen. The best I've seen is actually up at Siding Spring Observatory up near Kuna Barabran in the, in the Warren Bungle Ranges. That's where the big telescopes in Australia live, and it's about 1,200 metres altitude, 12, 1,300 metres altitude. The second best was a night I spent up at Perisher one night, and it was startlingly clear and dark and starry. The third, Interestingly enough, is Tura Beach on the north. I live in the northern end of Tura Beach, uh, away from the, the glow of Marimbula, and the sky can be wondrously dark here. So we're very, very far. If you're out in the bush a bit, like Candelo or uh, Walamla or anywhere else in the valley, then or, or for them further north, um, away from any major town, then you really have a wonderful place to see the stars from. And the Milky Way is gorgeous. If you just wander along it with a pair of binoculars, you'll see some absolutely gorgeous things. With a small telescope, it's even more beautiful. Star clusters, glowing nebulae, and ionized hydrogen clouds, all sorts of wondrous things. But we are inside our galaxy, and we, so we can't see it as a spiral, but they've been able, to, using radio telescopes and other things, to actually work out that, that we are a, a, a spiral galaxy. And it will look from the outside something like this. This is another galaxy, not too far away. You can see this through a small telescope, but this, of course, is a Hubble Space Telescope picture, which is why it's got so much detail. But if you have a look at that, if you were, say, two thirds of the way to the edge, you would see roughly what we see in our Milky Way. Just as a side note, you notice that the stars, that the color in the middle is a sort of reddish color. And there's the, they're the older stars. The, on the outside, it's the stars are bluer. They're young stars, just they're just formed and they're, and they're still very hot and young. And we also see an awful lot of little pink bits. They are ionized hydrogen clouds with young stars just forming and just and, and they have a lot of ultraviolet light in them and they ionize the, the hydrogen that makes it glow. Uh, as an aside, it's the pink bits that I study professionally, trying to work out the physics of them and how they vary with 
different contents and elements and all sorts of things. I won't go into that in detail, but it's the big bits that I look at. This is something called Messier 83. Another minor aside, Charles Messier was a French comet, comet observer. He was terribly keen on trying to find comets. And he kept finding things that he thought was a comet. And he said, bugger, it's a, um, it's a galaxy or it's a fuzzy patch and it's a nebula. So I'll make a, a list of all the ones that I get confused by. And he's not remembered for the comets he found, although he did find some. He's re remembered for his list of nebulae. Uh, and this one is number 83 in his list. So it's one of those ir ironies of, of astronomy that he's, he's remembered for something he wasn't actually trying to do. One of his objects is the nebula in Orion. This is a big observatory photograph. It's one of those pink bits. It's not a terribly big one, but what you can see more or less in the middle is a sort of bright bit. There are four very, very bright young stars in there. Um, and that's known as the trapezium. If you point your telescope, a small telescope at that, you'll actually see these, this quadruple star. Um, and it's right in the middle of, the, of, of, of this nebula. And, and it's those stars that make the, the gas glow. You can also see an awful lot of dust, black stuff. And this is the debris left over from exploding stars. It gets mixed in with the gas and dust and new stars form which, with a mixture of gas and some of the dust as well. So every time a star blows up, it makes the, the gas um, mixture slightly richer in, in heavy elements. And slowly but surely, the stars get, get developed more and more um, heavy elements like oxygen, carbon, nitrogen, and everything else you can think of. But the dust has all come from exploded stars. Anyway, this is an extremely pretty nebula, and you can see it uh, in Orion. It's in the, well, you can look at it two ways. If you take the classical view, it's the sword of Orion. If you take the Australian view, it looks like a saucepan. It's the handle of the saucepan. It's the middle star and the handle of the saucepan. If you look at it on a reasonably dark night when there's no full moon, uh, with binoculars, you can see it's actually a fuzzy patch. And with bigger telescopes, you can see some of the detail. It doesn't look quite that pink because your eyes not particularly sensitive to red, but it looks a bluish color. It's very pretty. And it's where young stars are forming. Anyway. Um, next, the other thing you can see in the sky is what's called a globular cluster. This is this particular one's called Omega Centauri. It's actually north of the Southern Cross, uh, which means that you can't easily see it except early in the evening. And it's, to, it's, it's, it's across, across the sky a bit from the Southern Cross. You can see it as a little round fluff ball in the sky. Um, it's the best one in the sky. And there are 10 million stars in that picture. That, of course, is a Hubble picture. Um, but you can see it almost as amazingly through a, through a large amateur telescope. And you can certainly see the stars with a, with a, me, a medium-sized amateur telescope. Uh, these are all gravitationally bound, so they're in orbits around each other. Uh, it looks like it's terribly crowded, but they, they don't collide very often. And um, in fact, I've never heard of anybody talking about colliding stars, because while they may be, there may be a lot of them, there's an awful lot of space between them, so they don't, don't collide. There's a couple of other ones. Um, well, there's a lot of other uh, uh, globular clusters, but this is perhaps the most beautiful. There's another one next to one of the Magellanic clouds, which is called 47 Tucana. That's almost as beautiful as this one. You can see them in small amateur telescopes, and it's worth look, tracking them down. Anyway, these are just some of the lovely things you can see. There are also other clusters of stars which are in clumps and sort of like the, the Pleiades, the Seven Sisters, uh, small star clusters of newly formed stars where the gas is blown away. Anyway, what do you look at these things through? Some of the best views in the Milky Way can actually be had through good binoculars. 750 binoculars, that means seven power with a, with a 50 millimeter uh, lens size are generally um, a very good choice, but smaller ones are also useful. Uh, and you can see a lot, particularly of star clusters in the Milky Way, just by looking at, looking at things with the binoculars. You won't see, you will see the, if you, have, if you hold your binoculars still, or have image stabilizing binoculars, you will see, uh, sorry, I just heard a noise outside. Uh, you'll, you, you can see the, the moons of Jupiter, but you won't see, you won't, unless you have very good eyesight, you won't see the rings of Saturn with binoculars. So 
the next step is a small telescope. There are some excellent small to medium sized telescopes that can be buy, you can buy for remarkably good prices compared to say when I was a kid. Um, most of them are made in China and so the good ones are of extremely high quality. But there's also a lot of cheap rubbish on the market. Uh, and I mentioned wobbly tripods before. Uh, you can tell generally the quality of the telescope by well, whether the, when you put it on its tripod, it wobbles. If it wobbles, then probably you need a better one. There are three ways you think, can think about a telescope to look at the stars and the planets with. The size of the lens or the mirror, and you can use a, a, a mirror to focus the light, a bit like a shaving mirror, or you can use a LED, lens in a conventional telescope. Then the mag so, so the size of the of the aperture, the magnification of the eyepieces, and um, perhaps the most important of all, how good the tripod or the other mount is. Refractor telescope, which is what you think of as a telescope, sort of our there Jim Boy type pirate telescope, uh, has a lens in the front which collects the light and it focuses down the tube to an eyepiece, which then allows you to to, to focus the light. It's what most people think of as a telescope. It's also very useful for, for whale watching and, um, and, and viewing birds. It has the great advantage of being compact and very easily portable and doesn't require much in the way of adjustment, provided you keep it clean. The next thought is a reflector telescope, which was originally devised by Sir Isaac Newton. Uh, it uses a parabolic mirror, which is a, 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 a concave mirror to focus the light. The good thing about this is it only has one surface you need to actually, to, optical surface you need to make, um, which means it's cheaper to make than a lens. And you can get quite big ones for very moderate prices, which means you can look for faint things, faint, and you can, get a, you can get wonderful views of star clusters and similar things. The third type is the sort of composite between the two, which has a, a corrector a lens, I suppose you could call it on the front. It's very compact and often goes, comes with what's known as a go-to mount, which once you've set it up, you can say, find Saturn, and it just goes, whir, 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 clunk, and it's, you've said there's suddenly Saturn for you, or Omega Centauri, or anything else you want to look at. Uh, so in other words, it makes finding these things hugely easier. Um, and it's certainly something to consider, but they are, of course, are more, comp more complex and therefore a bit more expensive. The cheapest telescope that you can get for a, with a big aperture is what's known as a Dobsonian. It's a variety of Newtonian telescope, but it, it's, its mount is very simple. It's it constructed a bit like a World War I howitzer cannon. It has a, a cradle which rotates and it holds the telescope tube in this cradle and the telescope tube can go up and down and the, the cradle can rotate left rot, rotates around. Uh, it's a very simple and very stable telescope, but of course it doesn't follow the stars. And that's one of the things about the go-to telescope is it knows where the stars are and it follows them. So you don't have to keep moving the object you're looking at back into the field of view. Anyway, that's a quick analysis of telescopes. Um, you don't need a very high magnification. People think, oh yes, I want a high magnification. 30 to 50 is usually perfect for star clusters in the moon. And you really don't want, uh, you know, says 300 times magnification. Anybody who tries to advertise their telescopes like that is trying to con you. You very seldom, even with a very big telescope, can you use that sort of power because the atmosphere blurs the images. It's like the twinkling of the stars; it, it blurs the images in the telescope. So low powers are generally what you what you need. Anywhere between thirty and maybe a hundred at the most. Where you buy these things from? Well, that there are a couple of specialist telescope shops in Australia. Um, and there's some dodgy brothers ones as well. Uh, I would not buy a telescope from Kogan or Dick Smith, for example, or for that matter, Australian Geographic, because they're a bit expensive and they aren't particularly good on the whole. That's not to say everything is bad, but it's, uh, it's safer if you want a good telescope to go to one of the specialists. The one I've bought two or three telescopes from is a mob called Bintel. They're now in Leichhardt. They were in York Street in Sydney and they do deliver, uh, you can order online but it's worth having a look at them. And they also know a lot about telescopes. So it's worth, if you're interested in buying a telescope, I would recommend them, but there are other ones as well. And other things, well, um, one of the more useful things now that we've got smartphones and tablets 
is a thing which makes use of the an app which makes use of the GPS in, built into these things and the compasses. And when you point it at the stars, it shows you a map of the stars and shows you what's, what the stars look like. You can, um, in other words, if you, want to, if you want to just rove around the sky, you install this application, it shows you some stars and you point it up in the sky and it shows you what you're looking at. So, and it'll tell you what star you're looking at. If you, and if you want to find or confirm that you're looking at Saturn, you just point at what you think is Saturn and it says, yes, that's Saturn or whatever it is. So you point it at the sky and it shows the map in the direction you're pointing. There are several on the market and, they, and the new ones come up pretty regularly. You can buy them from the Google um, application location or Apple, the Apple um, App Store, for example. Um, and it's the, it's the simplest place to go is, is one of those locations. But they're very useful. And here is a sort of screenshot of, uh, I just ran this tonight on Scott Starmap Pro. Uh, and this is just looking at sunset tonight, making the assumption, of course, that uh, there was uh, no clouds, but um, you know, it knows where things are even this, despite the clouds. And you can see that, that Mercury and Mars are close together in the, uh, in, the, in, the, in the bright twilight and then Venus is further up. So what you can also see is the names of the stars, for instance, Arcturus, which is a bright red star. It's about the fourth or fifth brightest star in the sky. But it shows you where the constellations are and what the constellations are you're looking at are. And it's very useful and it's a great way of learning how you'd find the, how you find particular things and you're learning where you, you learn your way around the sky. Anyway, that's all I wanted to say tonight. I see Doug's turning up. And um, all I can say is, is that if anybody has any questions, I'm more than happy to, to, to answer them. One thing I would say, however, I will be as, as I'm chatting with Paul West um, tomorrow on ABC Southeast Radio at 8.35 if you want to hear much the same coverage that you heard tonight. Take it Thank away, you. Doug. Thank you, David. That was... Uh marvelous and um i i said last year i think you've got a you've got a fantastic voice so I, I think you should probably do some audio books of you know carl sagan's reading uh, writings or your own I, i'd i'd buy one i'd listen to it um when you described the the maginalic clouds as luminous powder puffs against the velvet starry sky i was transported by that that was wonderful and um you were a little bit earlier than me but um you know, I think I said last time that my, one of my uh, pivotal scientific moments in my life was pointing my brand new two and a half inch refractor towards uh, a bright object and seeing the uh, rings of Saturn and, um, you know, nearly wetting myself at that point. And uh, when I was 13 and, and, you know, that moment of discovery when you share an experience that, um, you know, Galileo and uh, other astronomers also had, you become part of that collective of people that have turned their eyes to the universe and, and been, you know, transported by the wonders there. So thank you very much for that picture. Look, uh, we've got a, a Q&A question. There's a chap in there called Christopher Nichols. Do you, do you think he's a person of good character that I could allow to talk? I wouldn't trust him if I were you. He's my brother. <laughs> So look, I've I've enabled your microphone, uh, Christopher. So if you can speak there to your question, yeah, this is a bit of a Dorothy Dixon, I think. <laughs> um, so uh, my question was, what's it like in the middle of a, a globular cluster? Is it extremely bright all the time? Uh, and also, why don't all the stars in a globular cluster coalesce into some kind of galaxy? Interesting question. The first one, the first the first part is. Yes, you would have thousands and thousands of stars visible in the night sky. It would be an, an amazing image. There was, a, I think it was Isaac Asimov wrote a, a short story called Nightfall about a, 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 um, a civilization that, used, that, that, that had evidence that, it, that, that catastrophes occurred every few thousand years. They were a planet going around a multiple star system and they had, they, they, their story had it that they never, there was never a sunset except very occasionally, and suddenly all the stars were below the horizon and they, and they suddenly saw this sky full of stars. Um, and this, of course, created alarm and despondency among the residents of this putative planet. Um, but it's called um, uh, 
nightfall. It's a, it's, it's, it's a fascinating story. But yes, if you live, if you were inside a globular cluster, you'd uh, you'd have an, uh, it would be quite amazing uh, the number of brilliant stars you'd see around you. Um, and the short answer is to your second question: Omega Centauri is in fact the center of a small galaxy which got gobbled up by the Milky Way and most of the outer parts of it, the disk part, got shredded up and mixed up with the Milky Way stars. And it's just the central bit which is left over, which, is, which has enough gravity, mutual gravity to hang itself together. But they don't, they're, they're in orbit. So there's a balance between the orbital energy and the gravitational energy. So this, it's a bit like a satellite in orbit. It, it doesn't fall down. I mean, ignoring air drag, it'll stay there permanently. So these stars, uh, are in orbit around each other, around this sort of central center of mass. And they, um, it's, it's a stable system, in other words. Once the Milky Way has eaten up all the bits on the outside and it can't actually gobble up anymore, uh, the, 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 the core of the galaxy was strong enough to, to hold itself together and it's still there. But it's, uh, it's certainly a shadow of its former self. Very good, great question, uh, Christopher. And um, uh, you know the, uh, the the thought experiments that various people like Einstein and and other cosmologists have done of you know trying to imagine um, the uh, conditions within some of these bodies must be quite extraordinary. Um, and Asimov, when you mentioned, I was listening to uh, an audio book of Asimov's the other day, and I can't remember the title of it, but um, what an extraordinary mind that man was and uh i did say in the chat there that when you nominated your um top three uh david at the beginning there that people could let us know their um you know their peak astronomical observation or if anyone's got a um famous uh scientist to mention but uh, one of the stories i always uh think of that amused me was that sir isaac newton um, related that he could see so far because he stood on the shoulders of giants and uh, an American um, quantum physicist, um, Murray Gelman, I think his name was, mm. um, playfully played around with that and said, I've only been able to see so far because I'm surrounded by midgets. And uh, <laughs> I thought, I'm sure he was just being tongue in cheek, but um, uh, some of the scientists do have uh, massive egos as well. So maybe he wasn't, uh, he wasn't just joking. Well, scientists are human. Um, and they have all the faults that humans have, including hubris in big... I think, I think Murray Gilman actually won a Nobel Prize for something, so he, he had something to write home about. Yes. Um, paradoxically, Einstein's um, Nobel Prize was not for relativity, though it certainly should have been. He has two theories of relativity, the special theory, which says you can't go faster than the speed of light, and general relativity, which is a staggering intellectual achievement, which says that matter bends space and space tells matter where to move. Uh, but the mathematics in that is ferocious. I've got a book called Gravitation just sitting above me somewhere here. Uh, it's one of the most frightening books I've ever seen. It's got over a thousand pages and half the mathematics I don't even understand. But um, the difference between Newton and Einstein, uh, each was a towering intellect, but Newton invented his own mathematics in order to, un to, to explain things. He invented uh, the calculus, whereas Einstein used somebody else's math. So that's why I include Newton is perhaps even a greater scientist than Einstein. But uh, everybody has their own opinions. And of course, I'm ignoring the quantum physicists because they look at tiny things and I like big things. <laughs> well, there was a moment there when you, you looked up and said uh, there was a book on gravitation above you somewhere that the observers possibly thought you were orbiting the Earth in a, in a gravity-free environment. And But I assume it's on a bookshelf and not just floating around above your head. You can there. see it. This is it. <laughs> very it good. Very, very big. I got about a quarter of the way through it and then so no, this is beyond me. Right. But it's one of those books you have on your shelf to impress people and that you hope that they don't ask you if you've read it. A weighty volume on gravitation, very appropriate. So look, uh, we're approaching, well, we have reached quarter past six. Um, I'd just like to say on behalf of the uh, Science Hub, uh, David, thank you so much um, for being here tonight. Uh, part of the, the Hub's work is to, um, help make accessible to people the, um, the wonderful scientific resources that we have in our community, the people like yourself who um, 
may not be um, leaping out at them every uh, day of the week, but uh, we certainly appreciate the fact that in Chura Beach right there, there's someone with the depth of your knowledge and uh, the skills of communicating. So thank you very much for your efforts tonight. Um, there will be a follow-up email that goes to all um, the presenters and uh, you may get a, a link, as I said, an evaluation link and please um, uh, put you know, your thoughts down in that. That's always very helpful for us, but thank you. Uh, I, I think um, just quickly though, there's Alexander. You were saying, is it Alexander in Vienna? Um, David, is that? Um... Yes, that's right. He's my nephew, oddly enough. It's a sort of, it's a, um... Uh, sort of a family affair, this one. Right, yes. well, uh, I, I'd be remiss not to let uh, Alexander say hello from Vienna. I think that's a lovely touch. Actually, I think he's in Berlin, aren't you? In Berlin, Alexander? Yes, that's right. I'm in Berlin um, recording another CD. So. Oh, very good. <laughs> well, send me the details, Alexander, and I'll put that in the follow-up email as well and people can put an order in. That would... Uh... Yeah, right out, yeah. <laughs> what, what sort of music uh, are you working on? Well, we're, we're looking at um, uh, some a chamber music from uh, the Berlin um, court from 1740. So highly appropriate for playing while you're um, lying on a uh, deck chair looking up at the starry skies. Yes, yes. Uh, actually, a little question um, uh, that we had um, uh, is how different is the night sky in uh, Europe compared to um, the Australian night sky? Cork and cheese. We have the best night guys so far, so far ahead of them. See, what we do when we look up at, say, tonight, if it weren't cloudy, um, the centre of the Milky Way goes right overhead. In the, in, the, in the Northern Hemisphere, you have the outer bits of the Milky Way. There's still some very pretty stuff there, but there's nowhere near as much as there is that easy to see from the Southern Hemisphere. You can't see the Southern Cross, and there's some glorious mm. stuff in the south, near the Southern Cross, so absolutely beautiful things to look at. Star clusters, Dick, you wouldn't believe, and nebulae, and all sorts of wondrous things. So, so the poor people in the northern hemisphere don't uh, don't have anywhere near as much, as good a, a view of the night sky as we do. Right. Okay. Well, I'm looking forward to coming back home. <laughs> yes, yes, as soon as the virus disappears. Ha ha. Yes. <laughs> Well, great to hear from you, Alexander. And I, I apologise. I think you did put your hand up, but when I was putting another person's hand down, I accidentally put yours down. So oh, no worries, no worries. Good to hear from you. So thank you, everyone. Um, I get to this point in the night where um, I've got a red button that says end. It always feels a little bit um, rude. You know, I should turn the lights off and put the chairs up and encourage you all to leave. But I'll, I'll end the meeting on that note.